Hello, hello, everybody. How are you doing today? Happy Friday. Hope you're doing very, very well today. Wherever you're watching from in the world, this is Lloyd's Everyday English live, or maybe you're watching in the replay. And what we're doing today is something that I haven't done for quite a while. Actually, we uh, do this from time to time in uh, in our private community, English TV Live. I will leave the link in the description below if you uh, would like more information about joining our community. But what is the what are we doing today? So <laughs> it's called Ask Me Anything. Ask Me Anything. And I've done this several times over the last few years in our community. And I thought today, why don't we try and do this uh, on here on the channel? Here on my YouTube channel. So live question and answer Q&A. Ask me anything. So you can ask me anything about English, uh, about learning English, um, anything about me, <laughs> if you like, if that's interesting to you, or anything. That's the title. Ask me anything. Now, of course, there are certain things that maybe a polite person would not ask, but, <laughs> but it's up to you. Uh, you can ask me pretty much anything you want. Maybe there's some uh, burning question that you have on your mind today about how do I use this uh, sentence or this word or this grammar correctly? And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to try something a little bit different. I'm going to try <laughs> step out of my comfort zone a little bit, and I'm going to type on a document while I talk to you. So hopefully this will help to, to, to show you with some examples and to make things a little bit clearer if I'm typing on a, on a document at the same time as I talk to you. So if you have any questions, please leave them in the chat. I've already received uh, many questions um, from, uh, from Facebook, from, what, from our private WhatsApp group, um, and in, here, in the chat here as well. So I will do my best to get to everybody's question, and hopefully I will be able to uh, to answer them clearly, concisely, to the best of my ability. Um, but yeah, if you have any question, please feel free to leave it in the chat, and let's see how it goes. But let me just see who's with us right now. I can see Elif is here. Hello, hello. And Elif, um, who is over in Turkey, Elif left a question. Um, over on Facebook. So I will get to that momentarily. Trudy, how are you doing? Trudy's one of our private members as well. And also, Trudy, I think Trudy actually left the first question for today. So we'll get to that in, in a short, short while, in a short moment, momentarily, in a jiffy. Abdullahi, very nice to see you. Over in Somalia, greetings. Hello to Somalia. We have Angela here as well. Angela, nice to see you again. Angela was in our, um, and Elif as well was in our, uh, were in our uh, group speaking class this morning on Zoom. It was a lot of fun as always. And English with Terry is here as well, Mr. Terry. Very nice to see you. Make sure you go and subscribe to uh, Terry's channel over there. He's putting out. Lots of videos these days, lots of useful videos, um, lots of grammar lessons, but also lots of listening practice, quizzes, etc. Go and check it out. And Terry also has a, um, a new channel as well, only in Spanish. So where Terry only speaks in Spanish is for more for beginner English learners, I believe, of course, Spanish speakers. So Terry, feel free to leave the link to your channel, your new channel in the comments there. Luke English Addict says, why did you move from UK to South Africa? It's a very interesting question. That's a very interesting question. Um, well, okay, why don't I answer that one first then? It's an interesting question. Okay, so why did I move to South Africa? It's an interesting question. And even people in South Africa ask me that all the time as well. So what happened was, um, <laughs> what happened was when I was uh, 16, I finished school in England and um, 
my family moved back to South Africa. So my, so my mother was born in England, but she grew up in South Africa. Um, so actually my, my grandmother is South African and uh, my grandfather worked in many different African countries when my mother was a child. He actually worked for the United Nations. And eventually they settled in South Africa. So my mother grew up here. And so most of her childhood, her, all of her teenage years, you know, early 20s were in South Africa. She had a lot of good memories here. And she always wanted to come back. And um, so what happened was, um, I, don't, I won't go into too many details, <laughs> but uh, basically my mother wanted to come back to South Africa. We came here many times on holiday when I was a child. And so we were very familiar with the place. We liked it, of course, you know, the, the good weather, the sunshine. And um, my grandmother had an amazing house as well. She had a swimming pool, a tennis court. So we, were, we lived in quite a small house in England. So we were like, yes, yes, we want to go and live there. So the reason we came to live with my grandmother was because at that time she was living alone she was very weak. She was very frail, you can say. And we were kind of, you know, we wanted to come over here and um, firstly have a fresh start, but also, you know, help her as well, help to support her. Um, so it was a, you know, win-win. And, um, and it worked out very well. I mean, my sister is happily married to a South African man, Afrikaans man. Um, I mean, I don't live here all the time. I kind of come back and forth. Of course, with COVID, I've been kind of st stuck, you know, locked down here. But it's um, it's a wonderful country and uh, definitely recommend you visit if you get a chance. So, yeah, I <laughs> hopefully that answers your question. Uh, but yeah, most of my family is here in South Africa. Um, and everybody's enjoying it, especially when you <laughs> when you come from a colder country like England, you really do appreciate the, the nice weather for sure. Okay, we have Miss Victoria is here. Victoria actually asked a, asked a question, which I will get to in a moment. Hey there, have a good class, everyone. I'm on my way to my friend. We'll join you in the replay then. Okay, well, actually, I, I think I know which friend you're talking about. And uh, I spoke to that friend earlier, so I hope she's okay and say hello to her from me. Okay. Um, any other questions? All right. So here is a question from Elif, who is in the comments right now. She left a question on Facebook. She said, what is your favorite word in English and your favorite book of all time? This is interesting because it's, it's difficult to think of, uh, you know, your favorite word especially when it's in your own language, you know, you don't really always take time to think about whether a word is special or not. I mean, there are certain words which are, which are definitely not so nice. Um, but I made a little list. <clears throat> I made a little list of some words, which I like. And let me see. Okay, hold on. Let's come to the, let me come to the, document here. So I put all of the questions down here. And um, let me just put these down for the moment. Put these out of the way. We'll come back to those. Okay. So the, the words which came to mind, which I like. Um, first one is... I'll try and spell it correctly. <laughs> Exquisite. Luckily, we have spell check here. Exquisite is a very nice word, I think. Now, if something is exquisite, that means it is perfect or wonderful or even uh, delicious if you're talking about food. Exquisite. So it's per perfect, basically. It's just a really nice word that you can use to... Um, to really just emphasize how nice something is. Maybe I can make the, the words a little bit bigger here. Just bear with me, because this is the first time <laughs> that I'm doing this with a document on here. I know teacher Terry does this quite a lot. 
Um, exquisite is a nice one. And another word which came to mind, very nice, beautiful word, is plethora. Plethora. Oh, let me give you an example of exquisite first. Let's see if we can make a sentence. So, uh, the let me remove the underline and the ball. The dinner last night was exquisite. It's a tricky one to spell. <laughs> exquisite and you might go like this mwah, mwah, exquisite or the view of the sunset from the balcony was exqu <laughs> exquisite I've chosen a tricky word here exquisite when something is uh, yeah, perfect now another word which I like is plethora. <clears throat> plethora. It's a very nice word. It really rolls rolls off the off the tongue very nicely. Plethora. Now, you would say a plethora of a plethora of something. Now this basically means um, a huge or maybe even like almost almost unlimited amount of something all right plethora so we could say for example that um i don't know if anybody has a spotify here um i know i enjoy listening to music on spotify but it's amazing because you can find almost any song, almost any song. There are some songs that they don't have, but almost any song that you want to listen to, you can find there. Uh, there are, so there are a plethora of songs and genres of music on Spotify. Um, on the internet, there are, uh, plethora of um, uh, shopping websites online. You could probably never visit all of them. A plethora, a huge amount. So that's a nice word. Um, what was another one that I thought of? Let's just see if I can uh, just check my notes. Let me know in the comments if you have any, um, any words that you really like. Okay, okay. Let me give you one or two more that I that I like. Let me just come back to the document here. Um, another word that I like, it's kind of nice, is quirky. Just be careful with the pronunciation here. Qu, quirky, quirky, quirky. Now, how do I explain this one? So quirky, this is a, an adjective, and this means um, kind of strange or weird. Hold on a moment. Strange or weird, but, hold on, dun, 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 sorry, just give me a moment here. Just moving something out of the way. Okay, weird, but in a good way, okay? So of course, you know, you could, if you say someone's strange or weird, and you know, it could be a negative thing. But if you use the word quirky, it's kind of it's kind of cute, good or cute way. Now this can be for um, for people. It's probably most commonly used for people, but it could also be for for places as well. Maybe like. Uh, um, design design of a place or maybe so maybe like a hotel or a, a restaurant so imagine you go to a restaurant or a hotel and it's got a very kind of original kind of strange but interesting unique design you could say this hotel has a very quirky design 
but I like it, <laughs> right? Or maybe her personality is kind of quirky. I can see that uh, um, Terry wrote in the comments that Sheldon from Big Bang Theory is quirky. He definitely is, he's very quirky. Personality is kind of quirky. Uh, you know, but she's a lot of fun. So it's not really a negative thing. Uh, quirky. All right. Well, I think that's enough for now. I did have a few more. Okay. There's one more maybe uh, word that I like in English. Bliss. Bliss. Okay. So bliss is um, basically a perfect state of... Um, perfect state of mind, I guess. Like when everything is perfect and you are enjoying something so much, it is bliss. You could also say um, uh, blissful, as, sorry, bliss, blissful. So for example, um, you know, you can, uh, exper you can experience bliss. Uh, you know, if uh, if you are in love, right? Or maybe <laughs> when you are on a beautiful beach with a delicious cocktail, right? You are experiencing bliss. Bliss? Ah, oh, it's bliss. Ah, oh, this is bliss. Or maybe oh, this place is bliss. I never want to leave. Imagine you were on a, one of our members, Maureen, recently went to the Maldives and it looked like bliss to me. <laughs> okay. So everything is perfect. It's bliss, blissful bliss. Okay. So let me come to another question here. We'll come back to the document in a moment, but let me see if there's another question that I can answer here. David said, David said, um, let me just come back here in just a moment. Okay. David said, Hey, Hey David, I'd like to know how to speak English without fear of mistakes. And what is the difference between the UK and American English? My native language is Portuguese. I am Angolan. All right. Well, hello to Angola. And let me see, how can I help you here? Speak English without fear of mistakes. Well, I mean, the bad news, David, the bad news is that you have to face your fear. I'm sorry to tell you, I'm not going to give you any, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to tell you there's a secret magic pill that you can take and then the fear will disappear. Fear will disappear. It's kind of a rhyme there. But you need to, I mean, it's the most obvious thing in the world, but you need to practice. You need to, you need to speak. You need to talk to people. You need to, to do things that are uncomfortable. I mean, not only, you know, not only speaking English, but in life in general, right? If we want to overcome things, if we want to get better, if we want to improve, if we want to move forward, we have to overcome fear. Um, I mean, talking to you right now on a live stream. I remember the first time that I ever did a live stream was one of the scariest things ever. Um, I remember I was hesitating even to just to press the live button and it, you know, took time before I could get comfortable uh, recording on the camera, you know, and still it gets a little bit nerve wracking, but all of these things, any, if you want to improve in anything in life, you have to just push through the fear. You have to embrace the fear. Because when you feel that fear and you do something anyway, in this case, speaking English, you're going to get better. You're going to, it's going to get a little bit easier the next time and the next time. So my guess is that you are thinking a lot, but you're not practicing enough. You're not practicing. So you need to get out there. Well, I mean, online, <laughs> you need to, you know, make Make friends with people online that you can practice your English with. Um, join communities like mine, English TV Live, where you can practice with 
other English learners. I mean, there are a plethora. There you go. There's a plethora of options to practice your English online, especially now with everybody stuck at home. You know, there's so many options for you. So there's no magic pill. The only thing is you, you can do is just suck it up is a good expression, which means to just, you know, just do it, just do it and you will get better. I promise you that if you practice and practice and of course get feedback as well, if possible, get feedback from uh, from uh, English speakers, you know, fluent English speakers. What is the difference between UK and American English? My native language is put. So uh, <laughs> there's quite a few. There's quite a few. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, the biggest differences are some slang words. Um, you know, there's a few different, tiny different spellings that are not really that important. Um, I mean, the differences are not really that huge at the end of the day. You know, I mean, from time to time, Americans and Brit British people, when they talk to each other, might get a little bit confused. But if you know the context of the sentence or the conversation, then even if there's a word that you might not recognize, you can guess what it means based on the context, if you know what I mean. So I wouldn't worry too much. Just expose yourself to as much English as possible, whether it's UK, American, and you will start to see the differences. But the differences are not too massive, okay? I wouldn't worry too much. Uh, but, you know, you might want to, to make it easier for yourself. You might want to focus on just one to keep it simple. So if you prefer British English or American English, then maybe, you know, watch watch mostly American TV shows or watch mostly British TV shows, whatever, whatever you um, prefer. Because <laughs> I guess, you know, if you're just starting out, it could get a little bit confusing if you're kind of mixing them all the time. So maybe choose one and stick to it. But over time, you will start to see differences between the two. So don't worry too much. I can see that you are kind of overthinking. And that's actually one thing that I wrote down because one of the questions in a moment from Layla, who might be watching right now, she asked something similar. So I'll get to that in a moment. All right, what else do we have here? Um, Ivan says, hey, hey, Ivan, please tell us, please, sorry, <laughs> tell us, please, what are the most used grammatical tenses in the contemporary everyday speaking English? So, okay in contemporary everyday i would rather just say what are the most commonly used tenses in everyday spoken english keep it simple and speaking of simple all right so what are the most commonly used ones why don't we come back to our document here so the most co okay i would say that why don't we think about the ones that are used the least? Okay. I mean, the bad news is <laughs> the bad news, Ivan, is I, re I recommend you should learn all of the tenses. I mean, there's not that many, right? There's not that many. I mean, what? But probably the most, the, sorry, the least used ones, I would say. Probably the future perfect. It's not that commonly used. Probably the future perf. Jeez. The future perfect, um, future perfect continuous is not uh, is not that commonly used. Um, maybe the past perfect continuous. Maybe the, these ones are maybe not. At, I would definitely say the future perfect, future perfect continuous, at least in my opinion, are the least commonly used. Uh, maybe the past perfect continuous as well, but it's good to know all of them. I think it's good to know every tense because there's a a time and a place that you can use all of them. But in terms of the most commonly used, I would probably say uh, most commonly used 
would probably be the sorry I need to get rid of this underline present simple past simple um, present continuous and uh, past continuous <laughs> get quite a few and the present perfect and also probably um, future will and going to yeah and continuous <laughs> I mean, that's a lot right but that just shows you I mean the you want to know all of the tenses, but as I said, probably the least commonly used ones are the future perfect, um, future perfect continuous. What is the future perfect? So, sorry, let me just take a sip here. Okay. So future perfect is something like, I will have lived there for, uh, three years by tomorrow. Let's say that you have, you have, you see, present perfect, pretty commonly used. You have lived in a city for two years, 364 days. And then you're predicting, you're saying that, you know, by tomorrow, I will have lived, sorry, here. I will have lived here for three years by tomorrow. Wow. Tomorrow, I will have lived here for three years. So, I mean, there, there are situations when you could say that, right? I will have um, worked at this company for three years or, you know, or 20 years by tomorrow. Um, I will have, um, yeah. Uh, or you could, and you could change this to continuous as well. Future perfect continuous. I will have been working at this company for three years, so twenty years by tomorrow. Okay, so as, I mean, there's, there's, you're not going to say this kind of sentence too often. It's a really good sentence to to be able to say, but it's not something you're going to say every day. It's kind of used for specialized situations. So. I would say it's not that commonly used, but it's still good to know how to use it. And then past perfect continuous. Um, maybe you're telling somebody a story and you could say, I had, uh, I can't, geez, I need to get this <laughs> underlining bold. I had known her for two years at that point. Okay, that's the past perfect, right? That's the past perfect. No, okay, that, you couldn't say that in the continuous form. Let's say I had, uh, I had, and please feel free to give me examples in the comments. I had, um, Played tennis. Okay. I had been playing tennis for two hours before it started to rain. So this is past perfect continuous, right? I've been playing for two hours before it started to rain. Again, so you're giving like a timeline of how things happened. I had been doing this before that happened. Um, but, and then this happened. So again, it's a good structure to be able to use, to be able to know how to use, but it's maybe not that commonly used, especially something like the present perfect would be much more commonly used, right? I have, or the present perfect, present perfect or present perfect continuous. I have been, talking to you for I'm not sure how long so far <laughs> maybe 20 minutes so far I'm not sure for example 
So I hope that helps, Ivan. Uh, the short answer, the short answer is that you, I recommend you learn every tense, but uh, probably future perfect, future perfect continuous are the least, least commonly used ones. But simple present, simple past, present perfect, um, present perfect continuous, present continuous. These past continuous, these ones are really, really common. And of course, going to as well. I'm going to do that. I'm going to, you know, for plans, future plans and stuff. Okay. Here is an interesting one. <laughs> Let's change the topic very much. Go in a very different direction. Okay. So here we have a question from Miss Victoria, who I think is not with us right now, but hopefully in replay land. And she says, How's your progress with Russian so far? Um, yeah, well, I'm getting there, getting there. So I'm, I'm studying some Russian at the moment, a little bit every day, which I think is the best way to do it. You know, a little bit every day. If you can just do a little bit every day, it adds up over time. So I've been using uh, Duol Duolingo uh, quite a lot, which is really good. It gives you, it really helps to uh, boost your vocabulary and you have the spaced repetition, which is very important. It also, on the app, it gives you an opportunity to speak into your phone, and it gives you a little, little test on pronunciation, which is really tough in Russian. Um, so yeah, step by step. I would say the hardest thing, two hardest things I've found with Russian so far is reading the alphabet. It's really tricky because, I don't know, like the way that the letters come together sometimes doesn't make sense when I'm pronouncing it. And the pronunciation is pretty tough as well. But uh, step by step, uh, I think I need some help, some help, some practice with some native uh, Russian speakers. So um, if you're willing to help me and hopefully soon, I will be able to practice in reality. But um, second question here is, and also, and this is probably not one that I'm going to be able to help with too much. <laughs> Let me try. An English question. Maybe you know the color of this hair, what the color of this hair is called. <laughs> right. Well, you're asking the perfect person. This is, this is a hairdressing question. Okay, so what is the name of this color of hair? Goodness me. Okay. Well, <laughs> all right. Um, so I was thinking about this. <laughs> I probably should have asked a lady, but here's what I came up with. So the first thing that came to mind for this type of hair is that it's not one color. It is blonde hair. Now, again, this I might be wrong. <laughs> I might be wrong here. This is just what I think. Let me know when you see these uh, pictures, if this is what you're talking about. So blonde hair, okay, blonde hair with dark streaks. So you see these lines in the hair, which I guess are added on, <laughs> I guess, right? These are streaks, okay, streaks. So I mean, it could be either one. So maybe Blonde hair with dark streaks or dark hair with blonde streaks. I'm not sure what's going on here. But when there's extra lines added to the hair, because <laughs> I'm such an expert here, I would call them streaks. Okay? Streaks. Or you could also say highlights as well. So again, Victoria, let me know if this is if this is what you mean. I think is what you mean. But, you know, I might not be the right person to ask. Maybe one of our other teachers, like Diana, <laughs> could maybe be a better person to ask. But I hope that helps. I think darks, so blonde hair with dark streaks or dark highlights. I think that's right. I think. But um, don't, don't quote me on it, I guess you could say. I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, stake my... <laughs> English, edu um, um, I'm not going to stake my reputation on that, but that's what I think to stake your reputation on something means to, um, let me write this down. To stake your reputation on something 
means to basically you say if I'm wrong then don't believe anything I say again right Stake your reputation or something. So if I'm wrong, you should never believe me about anything again. But, so, <laughs> I'm not going to say that. But if you felt very strongly about something and you knew that you were right, then you could say, I will stake my reputation on this. I am definitely right about this thing. Maybe the scientist staked, staked? What is the past tense? Decided, um said he would stake his stake his reputation i have to double check that reputation on the accuracy of his uh, scientific research he said my research is 100 percent true you can believe me if it's wrong then i will resign i will retire okay let's move along here Okay, what else do we have? Okay, um, next question was from Trudy. Okay, actually that was the first question. First question which was asked today was actually from Trudy. Let me just check in with the comments here, actually. Let me just see if there's any, any comments that I've missed from anybody. So what do we have here? Okay, so maybe I was wrong. Platinum blonde. There you go. There's your answer. But I would definitely say streaks. Yeah. So if somebody has lines in their hair, streaks. And then there's another word as well. So let's say that. Let's say that somebody dyed their hair blonde, for example. Their natural hair color was dark. And then they dyed their hair blonde. And then after some time, the dark color started to appear again in that case you could say your roots are showing your roots so the roots like the roots of a plant roots of a tree the roots of your hair as well the roots are showing it's not a good not such a good thing right it means okay i need to go and get them touched up i guess now this is not something that uh, really affects me too much but it's what i've heard from my mother and other ladies in my life. Okay. Perfect burger. Oh, sounds pretty good. I'm getting hungry now. Dun, 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 dun. Abdullah, he says, excuse me, teacher, uh, RP accent. So that's receive pronunciation. I don't most people don't speak in that accent anymore. So received pronunciation is kind of the the old fashioned, you know, like the the news readers, like the BBC news readers from the 1950s. Like, Welcome to the 10 o'clock news. I can't even do it, but <laughs> I would definitely not focus on RP. I mean, if you like it, if that's what floats your boat, if that's what you prefer, go for it. Right. But it's definitely not a commonly used one anymore. I heard it, it's a tiny percentage of people use the RP accent these days. It's good to know. It's good to recognize it, but I wouldn't really focus on that unless you want to. I mean, it's, it's your it's it's your learning journey. You can do whatever you want, but it's not commonly used. Strands of hair. So a strand of hair is just one specific bit of hair. I noticed the other day, I'm not sure if we can see it. I noticed I had a, a gray strand of hair, a gray one, which appeared the other day. I'm not sure if we can see it now, thankfully. Um, that was very depressing. But a strand of hair is just one piece of hair. So I, strands, I mean, maybe, but I would rather say streaks, I think. Again, I might be wrong here, but... 3%. Yeah. Okay, there you go. 3%. I thought I, I heard 2% the other day, 3%. It's a tiny percentage. And it's, it's not, I mean, it's up to you. 
it's up to you. I would rather focus on an accent than more people because you're not going to have too many examples. Uh, if you watch, watch TV shows and stuff, people are not speaking in RP unless maybe it's the news or something. It's not really how most people talk. So up to you, but that's my personal opinion. All right, let's come back to the document here. So the next one. <clears throat> so Trudy, she asked this morning. Actually, the reason that I decided, excuse me. The reason that I decided to do this, ask me anything, question and answer. We get a lot of questions in the in the in our private WhatsApp group. And um, one question this morning was from Trudy. She she seemed a little bit panicked. And she asked, Lloyd, what are mass nouns? Seemed like a, like she was very worried, worried about it. So mass nouns. Now, this is the basic thing you need to remember. When it comes to nouns, there are two main categories, okay? These are, and I'm sure you know this already, countable and Un, when we are okay, when we, I mean, there's different categories of nouns, but when we are counting them or talking about the amount of something, we have countable and uncountable nouns. Now, to keep it simple, uncountable nouns are, are also known as mass nouns. Maybe there's, as far as I understand. Some people say that mass nouns are, are like a type of uncountable noun, but I've, I've heard other people who say they're the same. Let's just say they're the same. You don't need to stress about it. You don't even need to worry about it, really. The only thing you need to remember is countable and uncountable. Countable, some people call it unit nouns. Okay? Some people call them mass Some people call them mass nouns. Some people call them uncountable. I'd say most people call them uncountable. Now, why don't we look at some examples? So accountable and okay, why don't we do this? So countable is nouns that we can count, right? We can say this, there's one, there's two, there's a hundred, there's a million of this thing. Countable, uncountable means it, it, you cannot give a specific number of that thing. Um, for example, um, for example, air. Air is uncountable, right? Wind is uncountable. Water is uncountable, unless you make it countable. I'll look at that in a moment. Countable things, table, microphone, teacher. You can count. There's one teacher talking to you right now. Um, hello. Um, and uh, there are maybe 13 people watching right now, which is wonderful. I'm very happy to have you with me. So why don't you give me some examples in the comments? So, okay, look, why don't we do this first? Let's do countable nouns first. Give me some examples of countable nouns in the comments, and then I'll, I'll put them in the document. So in the comments, please write some countable nouns. Countable and uncountable nouns. Give me some examples. And then I will write them down. <laughs> Terry says, I want to hear Lloyd's posh accent. You want to hear my posh accent? My posh accent is not very impressive, actually. Not very impressive at all. Unfortunately not. All right. Examples, please. Countable, uncountable nouns. Okay, well, I can't see any examples in the comments. So let me give you one, okay? Tree is countable, right? Table, people, and remember that, not persons. You could say persons, but that would be very posh. People, teacher. So we could say, for example, all right, Terry has a good example in the comments. <clears throat> Cups of coffee, okay? cups of coffee now this is countable all right the interesting thing here is that coffee 
is uncountable, okay? We have coffee. Coffee itself, the liquid, is uncountable. So water, coffee, beer, we actually, they should not be countable. But what happens here is that we add a um, special word, a unit, a counting word, right? To make, to make it countable. So we say a cup of coffee. And then we can say one cup of coffee. Now the thing is coffee is so commonly uh, enjoyed and drunk. We say this all the time, every day, one cup of coffee, one cup of coffee, one cup of coffee. So eventually people decided, let's just say one coffee. But it is one coffee means one cup of coffee. It doesn't mean one, you know, liquid <laughs> coffee. It means one cup of coffee. Now let's look at another example. Trudy says money and happiness. Okay, so that's a good example. Money is countable or uncountable? It is uncountable. <clears throat> so we cannot say one money. Can't say one money. So we have to use <clears throat> quantifiers to describe how much. For example, some money, a lot of money, a bit of money, no money. <laughs> okay, but we cannot say one money. Can't say that. Can't say that. Cannot say that. So, yes, uh, that's an example. Also, happiness. Happiness is uncountable. Okay, so for example, this uh, job gives me a lot of happiness. Okay, for example. Um, so that's the important thing to remember. Countable, uncountable. Another one is um, Let's see if we have any other examples in the comments. Okay, Olga says, a table, an orange, a boy, a rose, a card, etc. Yes, these are all countable. You could have 10 cards, two oranges, five boys, two tables, six roses. That's an interesting story, I'm sure. <clears throat> Abdullah, Abdullah, Abdullahi says, pen, table, mobile, accountable. Happiness, fish, are uncountable. Fish is an interesting one. Because as with English, there are always, of, uh, you know, always exceptions, right? So fish, um, a lot of fish, 10 fish. I think it can be either one. A lot of fish, 10 fish. And sometimes you can say fishes as well. 10 fish. Um, so I think fish, might, um, unless I'm mistaken, fish is a exception there. Terry maybe can back me up in the comments there. We have here, Yassar says, Yassar says, music, chocolate, money, and countable. Yep. So again, so for chocolate, chocolate is uncountable. Chocolate itself, the product, the um, delicious substance is uncountable, right? I ate too much chocolate today but if we want we can make it countable though so we can say piece of chocolate right can I have a piece of chocolate please please can I have a piece of chocolate so yeah that's another, another common one is advice common one is advice um, so I've heard people say advices you can't say that so an important thing with uncountable nouns is you cannot use the determiner, okay? So you cannot say, um, uh, what was an example there? Um, a money, okay? 
You can't say our money. You have to use something something like some money, etc. Okay. All right. Hopefully that's clear. So just uh, the main point is uh, for Trudy is that mass nouns are the same basically as uncountable nouns. All right. Easier question here from Leo Miller, one of our members. She says, Lloyd, beer or champagne? Beer or champagne? Interesting question, Leo Miller. Um, I would say my, <laughs> my go-to drink for alcohol, I mean, not for any drink, but for alcohol, is beer. So this is a good word you can use, a good adjective. Something that you commonly have. It's your go-to drink. It's like the, the first one you choose. So if I go to a bar, a pub, I would most commonly order a beer. It's my like go-to drink. If I meet some friends, I, I probably would order a beer. My go-to drink. And, but I love champagne. I really do love champagne. I really, really like champagne. But it's kind of, Champagne, I don't know what the situation is like in Ukraine with champagne. Of course, you could say, like, champagne is the the name of the, you know, like the French one, the more expensive one. But it's basically, you could also say sparkling wine. It's the almost the same, but it's just cheaper, right? So <laughs> I don't really drink the official champagne. It's too expensive, but sparkling wine uh, is basically the same and much cheaper and I really like sparkling wine but it's kind of one of those drinks that you drink more commonly when you're celebrating right you have something to celebrate maybe you got a got a promotion at work or you uh, passed your exam or uh, something really good happened if it just feels to me usually that's the context that we have sparkling wine or a party a birthday uh, I don't know why that's the case <laughs> but it usually seems to be like that but I really do like sparkling wine and um, yeah, um, both are good. Both are good. Depends on the situation. <laughs> it also depends on your mood as well. Like sparkling wine can, can get you pretty quickly. You can feel quite, whoo, you can feel quite, um, quite tipsy. Whoo. Layla asks, she asked this in the WhatsApp group. She said, can you explain why native speakers say in here and in there when in many countries teachers teach students just to say, for example, I am here, so I am in here. We were taught that expression isn't correct. I don't know who taught you that's incorrect. I know that Terry kind of explained this in the WhatsApp group, but just to repeat for everyone, everybody one more time. So here, okay, I am here is the basic form, right? I am here as I'm talking to you right now. I'm there, <laughs> sounds a bit strange, but you're just talking about the location. I am here, I am here. If you say I am in here, it adds some extra information. So it shows that you are inside somewhere. I am in, let's say, hey, where are you? Hey, I'm in here. I'm in here, I'm in the kitchen. So when you add the word in, it knows that it makes it clear that you are inside somewhere. You couldn't, if you were outside, you couldn't really say I'm in here, right? Because you can't really be inside something outside. It would be you're in a room, you're in a cupboard, I don't know, you're in the kitchen, you're in a specific room. I'm in here, I'm in here. I'm so. Someone's looking for you. I'm in here. I'm here. Or if somebody can see, I'm here. I'm here. Come here. So they're both the same. Just in here just adds more information. Hopefully that's nice and clear. Layla also has another question. She said this in the YouTube chat uh, at the, uh, earlier on. Hello from the other side of the screen. Hello, Layla. Um, can you share from your teaching experience what is the common mistake foreigners make speaking English? What problems do you often meet among them? So I made a little list here. I was thinking about what are the biggest mistakes that I see? We, we spoke about one earlier, right? With, uh, um, with David, who had a problem with fear of making mistakes, right? 
So this is what I can't, the list I came up with. So the biggest mistakes English learners make, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, by the way, you see this quite often these days. I am O. I am O. You see this in text messages a lot. I am O, in my opinion. First one, and this is kind of what we already spoke about earlier, hesitation. Worried about making mistakes. So if you hesitate, you're not going to make the progress that you want to. Okay, you're always like, oh, should I say this? Should I say that? If you at least try, if you at least try, then you will hopefully, if you make a mistake, you'll learn from this mistake. Oh, okay, I shouldn't say it like this. If you're getting feedback, of course, which is important too. So hesitating, worried about making mistakes, um, getting words from the dictionary without knowing if and how they are used. So this is quite a common one. Quite often I will <clears throat> be talking to students, English learners, and they will say a word which just sounds very out of place and, um, you know, uncommon or even wor a word that I've never heard of before. So you want to be, you want to be careful when you get, of course, the dictionary is fantastic, but you want to be careful and make sure that these are words which are actually used today. You don't want to get a word which was commonly used a hundred years ago or in Shakespeare's time. You want to make sure that these are words which are you know, used every day. So a way to overcome this is when you get a new word, try to get it when you are listening you know, to TV shows or maybe reading books, modern books. Be careful with the older books because they have words which are not so commonly used. So make sure you have a context where this word is used. See how this word is used in a sentence. Find several examples of how the word is used within a sentence, because if you have an idea of how to use it, then it's more likely you will use it naturally. Instead of just having the word and thinking, okay, it means this, so let me try and say, because then it could, you could use it in the wrong way, if that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Terry says, fishes are super old. Exactly, I wouldn't say fishes. It's kind of like persons. Persons is not incorrect, uh, like persona in Italian, uh, sorry, Spanish, right? Persona, but persona, <laughs> my, my pronunciation is not good. But uh, we would say people most commonly. 99.9% .9 of the time you say people, not persons. Even though persons is not incorrect, it's too formal. Another one, overthinking, trying to complicate things, trying to be perfect. So a problem, if you are trying to be perfect all the time, this sentence has to be perfect. Every, the grammatic, grammar has to be exactly correct. I mean, look, I'm stumbling on my words as I'm talking to you now, right? So it doesn't have to be perfect. Native English speakers, native speakers in any language are not speaking perfectly the whole time. We make mistakes all the time. We stutter on our words. We make mistakes. I mean, if you look at the president, the new president of the United States, Joe Biden, he stumbles on his words all the time. And he's the president. So don't worry too much about it. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect. Keep it simple, if anything. I think I really believe in keeping it simple. Um, and then over time, you can build on that. Prepositions is a big one. We will come to that in a moment. There's another question about prepositions. But I've noticed with a lot of English learners, they have big problems with prepositions and using them incorrectly. Again, I will give the same advice I gave with the dictionary uh, example, and that is to look at as many examples of the prepositions being used within a sentence, and also try not to think of the prepositions by themselves, but try to think of them as connected to the verb, okay? So think of them connected together. So for example, look at or talk to think of them in one phrase instead of just thinking talk now am i talk, using talk to or at or with remember that it's you know i talk to this person pronunciation oh sorry um 
Yes. Uh, okay, uh, pronunciation is a big, uh, you know, can be a problem. It depends on the on the country, the nationality of the person. Um, but different nationalities have different pronunciation problems. Um, many countries seem to have the e and i problem. So again, it just comes with practice and repetition. And being obsessed with accent. <laughs> so one of our, um, not to pick on you, Abdullahi, but you were, you seem quite focused on the accent, which is, you know, perfectly fine. But in my opinion, in my personal, humble opinion, IMO accent is not particularly important. Pronunciation is much more, much, 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 much more important than uh, accent. I mean, look at me or listen to me. I have a very, very strange accent. I've lived in many places around the world. And when I meet people, they always say, Lloyd, or, you know, hey, man, <laughs> where are you from? Where are you from? I say, you know, I'm from here or I'm from England. People don't believe me because my accent, people think I sound like I'm German or Dutch, some people think, or European. Um, just, I mean, I am technically European. If you, the UK is technically Europe, but people cannot put their finger on which which accent I have. But hopefully you will agree that I speak nice and clearly. I make an effort to pronounce things nice. Part of being a teacher is you want to speak clearly, pronounce nice and clearly. A lot of native speakers, especially, I, I'm sad to say, especially a lot of native British speakers, and including me, I used to do. I used to do this. I've worked on um, not doing this anymore. Is mumbling, right? Mumbling. Hey, how you? What's going on? How you? How you doing? So when you speak, you don't speak clearly. Can be very difficult to understand. So pronunciation, in my book, in my opinion, always overrides uh, accents. Focus on the pronunciation. Accent is secondary, in my personal opinion. Okay, so Gulna asked this in our private WhatsApp group. She said, uh, she said, I don't think about your lesson. So she talked about us about prepositions. How and this is a very good point. So one preposition, we actually we talked about this in the Zoom, our Zoom session today. One preposition can change the meaning of a phrase. A sentence completely right one preposition throw to throw at shout to shout at dream of dream about it's a very good point so why don't we look at these um and again what you need to do is learn these together and see the context and you know make as many look at as many examples as you can but let's look at let's look at this one so throw to throw something to someone or throw something at someone. Now, does anybody know the difference? Before I explain, does anybody know what, what would be the difference between these two? Throw something to someone or throw something at someone? Can anybody explain what the difference is between these two? Throw something, if I throw something to you or throw something at you, there's quite a difference. Likewise, you could also say, speak to someone or speak at someone. They have kind of a different feeling. Talk to someone, talk at someone. Does anybody have an idea? Let me just catch up with the comments here. Okay, I can't see any comments that I've missed here. All right, well, let me try and explain here. So the, the difference here is <clears throat> if you throw something to someone, this means you are you're giving something to someone and it's softer, softer. Okay. 
right? Let's say, for example, okay, Trudy has the right idea here. Trudy says, if you throw something at someone, you mean to hit him or her. Exactly right. Exactly right. So if I say, for example, hey, could you, could you throw me the, well, not the scissors, <laughs> not the scissors, could you throw me this hat, English TV Live hat? I throw it to you, okay? I throw it to you. But if I throw something at someone, this is kind of like <laughs> attacking someone. If I, it's more, it's, it's uh, more aggressive. So let's say, for example, let's say that uh, I have this hat and I throw it at you. It's like, ah, hate you. I, <laughs> I don't know why I hate you, but throwing it at you. I can't believe you threw the, I can't believe you threw that, um, I don't know, what did you throw at me? I can't believe you threw that, uh, that table at me. Ah. So it has a more, when you say towards, when you are talking about something towards someone throwing, throw at them is more aggressive. Now, similar example is talk to someone or talk at someone. What do you think the difference is here? What do you think the difference is here? Talk to someone and talk at someone. How, what do you think the difference would be? If you talk to someone, you talk at someone. Now talk at someone is not really that commonly used, but you'll hear it from time to time. Um, so talk to someone just means you are having a conversation talking to I was talking to my friend <clears throat> talking to my boss talking to my buddy you could also you could also say talking with someone as well talking to talking uh, talking at someone means you are, hold on, only you are talking and you are not listening to the other person. Okay. So as, as I said, this is not that commonly used talk at someone, but you know, imagine there's a, there's a situation where somebody's talking to you and they are just, you know, kind of, they, they're just talking, 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 and they don't care what you have to say. They're just it's like, they're talking at you. It's like, Hey, look, you're talking at me. Can, can you listen to me? Can we have a conversation here? Can we talk to each other? So talking at somebody is kind of aggressive, right? So basically someone who's a very bad listener, very bad conversationalist. You could also say speak at someone, speak with someone, speak to someone. So at has that kind of in that in these words has that meaning of kind of more aggressive. Okay. So the idea is that uh, that's why I say it's so important to learn the correct prepositions because it can ch just one little word there, talk to, talk at, throw to, throw at, can make a huge difference. Um, dream of, dream about, I've talked about that before, but talked about it before. They can be interchangeable. Dream of is kind of more formal. Dream of is when you're talking about your future dreams. I dream of a better future. It's kind of formal. Dream about is uh, more literal, like, Last night I had a dream about this thing, but you could also say I'm dreaming about doing this one day. Say I would say dream about is more commonly used, but dream of is only talking about the future. 
All right. I'll just just I don't want to I don't want to take up too much of your time. So we're almost finished with the questions I have here, unless anybody has any more. Now, Ekaterina always has interesting questions, and this she left these questions on on a private Facebook group. So, Lloyd, I've got a couple of burning questions for you. Ah, burning so hot. First one is ain't ain't. Uh, as far as I know, it means either of these options. Am not, isn't, aren't, doesn't, don't, haven't, hasn't. Correct me if I'm wrong, please. I'd rather say, could you correct me? It just sounds a little bit more polite. Could you correct me if I'm wrong, please? Add a, if you add a, a modal at the beginning, it just softens it a little bit. Okay. If you say, correct me if I'm wrong, it just sounds like more of an order. Okay, just so you know. <laughs> I know that's not your intention. Ain't is an interesting word, but I have to say off the bat. Off the bat means... Off the bat means from the beginning. So I have to say off the bat that I almost never, maybe never, use this word. It's, it's kind of, now, I mean, people do use this word. It's, and I don't want to sound, you know, rude or whatever, but it's, it, it is kind of sounds a little bit lower class, maybe. Um, although it is quite commonly used in songs. Uh, so uh, Kate has a good example here. Ain't nobody, ain't nobody, or Ain't no mountain high enough, right? It's a good one, classic song. So it's, you hear it in songs quite a lot, but in conversation, I don't really use it myself. And if you do use it, it sounds kind of a little bit lower class in my opinion, not to offend anybody. Um, but here's an interest, but when can you, when can you use it? Because it's, it's a, a very flexible word. <clears throat> Even though I don't use it myself, it is pretty flexible. So Kate is asking, can you use it for all of these? <clears throat> And I'm going to have to think about this. We're going to have to go through it one by one. So, am not is the first one. Okay, I am not angry with you, let's say, as an example. So we could take this, we'll put ain't. I, I ain't angry with you. Yes, you could say that. You also say people hear people say like, I ain't mad. I ain't mad. <laughs> I'm not mad. So yes, you can use this one. The next one is isn't. So uh, it isn't working <coughs> properly. Maybe your phone, your computer isn't working properly. Let's try this one with ain't. It ain't working properly. Yes, <coughs> you can use that. Aren't we aren't going to say sorry? Let's try this. We ain't gonna say sorry. Yes, yes, that works. That is correct. Um, doesn't. Okay. I so I think this might be the only one that doesn't work. Doesn't work. There you go. Doesn't. She doesn't want to go there. So in this case, she ain't want to go there. No, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. That doesn't. So with does and doesn't, <clears throat> doesn't, doesn't work. She ain't gonna go there, you could say. She ain't going to go there. That means she isn't going to go there. That is fine. But uh, no, that does not work. Doesn't, don't. Okay, don't. Let's try that. I don't have any more time. So, oh, sorry. I ain't have any more. So, no. That doesn't work, but you could change it. You could say, I ain't got. 
I ain't got. So in this case, you asked about haven't. So yes, that's right. I haven't, I ain't, hasn't, she hasn't, she ain't. Yes, that is correct. So the only one that doesn't work here with ain't is doesn't and don't. And the last one, I think, so ain't nobody, <clears throat> ain't nobody, ain't, no, ain't nobody loves me better than you. It's a good song. Ain't nobody loves me better. So in this case, all right, this is a weird one, but ain't nobody loves, do you know this song, everybody? Ain't nobody loves me better. That means, in this case, there is no one who loves me better than you, right? There is no one. Ain't nobody. So in this case, ain't, you can see, is very flexible. This word ain't is very flexible. In this case, ain't means there is... In this case, no one, nobody, nobody, no one that loves me better than you. Okay, the last question I think, okay, there was one more. Hmm. There was one more, where is it now? Let me see if I can find it. Thank you for sticking around everybody. I hope, <laughs> I hope it's been interesting. I hope it's been um, uh, useful. Let me know in the comments if you enjoy this kind of, um, this kind of uh, live stream Q and A, and we can do it again. Um, is there any? There was there was another one. Let me just see if I can find it. Let me just see if I can find it quickly here. Now I understand. I'm happy to hear that. So if you just give me one moment here, so I can try and find this question, which was also from Kate. All right. Uh, okay, so she was asking about double negatives. So this is her question that she wrote. She said, would it be okay if I asked you to write something on the screen? Okay, I, I'm doing that. Double negative. I heard sometimes, so let me just read the question because I can't seem to find it right now. Um, would it be a, <laughs> I heard that sometimes double negatives does the opposite effect and makes a sentence positive. For example, she says here, so what is a double negative? That's when we use two negatives to make a sentence, right? To make a positive sentence. So in this case, I wasn't looking for nobody. I wasn't looking for nobody. Now, if you are not looking for nobody, that means I am looking for someone. So this is the literal meaning. The literal meaning is, yeah, I'm looking for someone, somebody. Okay. Now, this sentence here sounds kind of, again, it's kind of in the same category as ain't sounds kind of a little bit lower class. So I wouldn't recommend that you say it like this. Again, people do speak like this. Just saying, I don't speak like that myself. I wasn't looking for nobody. It's kind of, I wasn't looking for nobody. I wasn't looking for, you might hear Cockney, kind of Cockney people saying like this. Well, I, wa I wasn't looking for nobody. So in this case, even though this means I am looking for someone, in the conversation, this person means I wasn't looking for anybody. So this is the correct sentence. Okay, this is the correct sentence, but it's actually a mistake. It's a, it's a mistake that some people make. Okay, so it's a double negative and you will hear sometimes people will joke about this. They're saying, ah, actually you mean I was looking for someone. Like, no, I, I didn't mean that. Okay, so in that case, it does mean it means this, okay? However, there are double negatives which are very uh, good ones to know. So for example, Kate says, I couldn't, 
I couldn't not help him. Okay. I couldn't not help him. Now this means, um, <clears throat> I had no choice, but to help him. Um, maybe for example, uh, uh, maybe I felt so sorry for him, for example, I could not help him, right? You're, so you are emphasizing the fact that you had to do this thing, right? I had to do it. I could not do that, right? So this is a really good, a good, uh, uh, structure to know. Let's say for example, wow, you got me. I can't believe you got me, um, a present for my birthday. It's like, I couldn't not get you a present for your birthday. I could not get you a present for your birthday. Come on, we're best friends. I could not do that. Right? So it's emphasizing that I had to do that. It's impossible that I could not do that. Okay, does it make sense? I know it's a little bit confusing, but it's quite an interesting structure to know. And Kate says, I couldn't help, but help him. She says, does it sound a little bit wordy? This one sounds a little bit wordy. Yeah, I couldn't help but help him. I wouldn't repeat help in this sentence. I might rather say I couldn't help, but um, I couldn't help, but um, <laughs> I would rather say like, I had no choice but to help him. That sounds better. I couldn't help but join in or I couldn't help but you, you want to try and like not repeat the words too often, you know, I'm not sure if that helps too much, but I couldn't help but do that. It's a really good, really good uh, structure to know. So thank you to everybody who stuck around until this time. I know it's been quite a long live stream. I didn't intend for it to be quite this long, but there were quite a lot of questions. I couldn't help but what is it? Oh, sorry, I couldn't not. Okay, let me try that again. I, I'm confusing myself now. I couldn't not answer all of your questions, right? Because I want to help you guys. I couldn't not answer all of your questions. I come on, I couldn't not answer all your questions. So yeah, um, Hopefully it was an interesting lesson. Thanks so much for watching everybody. Uh, whether you're watching live or in the replay, have a wonderful rest of the day. If you have any other questions, uh, leave them in the comments below and subscribe to this channel. If you have not yet hit the notification bell, so you never miss another video. Have a wonderful rest of the day, wonderful weekend. And I'll talk to you all again very soon. Any last words? I couldn't, but help him. Um, I'd rather say I couldn't not help. I couldn't not help him. I couldn't not help him. Right? So I couldn't not help him. I couldn't do anything but help. I couldn't but help him. I couldn't not help him. So like I had to do it. I couldn't not help him. I couldn't not help him. I think that's right. I'm confusing myself now. I've been t I've been talking for like an hour and a half. So I'm starting to confuse myself. I couldn't not help him. Sounds a bit better. Um, couldn't but help him. Sounds a little bit formal. Happy to hear it was useful. Um, great. Okay. Well, thank you, Trudy. Thank you, everybody. Uh, if there's any more questions, leave them below and uh, maybe I can clear up some more things uh, later. My mind's getting a little bit confused now with all of these <laughs> things going on. Uh, but thank you so much for watching, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Talk to you all again very, very soon. Bye bye.